thank you all for coming in the morning and showing up. Um, hopefully your commute wasn't long as I know it was for uh, one of our, our panelists today had to make the drive into the office early. So thank you for that, Mike. Um, I'm Tracy with The Circuit. Uh, we're glad to have you all here. This is our open education forum that we offer throughout the year. Uh, some of you may have heard, we just started our conversations yesterday on how we're gonna address things for next year. So keep your eyes and ears open for uh, our digest newsletter that comes out from Taryn and on LinkedIn for more details of upcoming events. We've also just booked and confirmed our annual event will be September 15th next year at back at Hard Rock Casino. So you might wanna put a placeholder on your calendars there. We'll be getting out to save the date. Um, we had great turnout this past year with about 200 folks. So expect to see all of them and some more next year. So I'm already well into planning for 2022. So um, today we're fortunate to have a great panel with us to talk about some uh, software issues in cloud and all of that. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick Enger. Um, thank you, Nick and the ATC team. You've been our annual sponsors for this series this year. Um, we appreciate all you have done to support the circuit, this community uh, and helping us with topics and all of the things. So at this point, I'm gonna be quiet and let Nick go run the show from here. <laughs> well, thanks, Tracy. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the sponsor, the circuit allowing us to sponsor today's event. Um, again, my name is Nick Enger. I'm the CTO at ATC, Advanced Technology Consulting. I have the privilege of moderating today's Breakfast Bites discussion titled Beyond Lift and Shift, Building Native Cloud. This topic could go in a number of different directions, uh, with, especially with the star-studded panel that we have. God only knows where it might end up for us. So let's, um, I'm gonna give a quick intro on, on myself and my company and then kind of roll into the, the topic at hand. So for a brief intro, again, I'm the CTO at ATC. We focus in four core areas of digital transformation, voice, network, cloud, and security, which is perfect for today's discussion. In our world here at ATC, no one cloud fits all. It's a, it's a conversation that we need to have about how does the, the application fit within the framework of whatever cloud we're going to. We represent 400 different vendors in this space. So it allows us to work on your behalf to understand what the business drivers are of the organization and align yourself with the right fit for what you're trying to accomplish. Not all cloud is equal, and this rock star panel is going to have their own spin on the conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Before we get started, thank you again to the circuit uh, for the opportunity to speak today. I, I believe these venues are what we need in the IT industry. We need to be able to, to share best practices and past experience in a safe and open forum. And it pushes us forward as an industry. From an industry perspective, I, I, I've said this time and time again, it seems as though we, we hold our cards really close to the vest and the circuits is giving us an av, a, a venue, if you will, to share these experiences in a, in a safe place. Um, so we at ATC appreciate the opportunity to, and, and really support the idea of being able to open up this conversation. In an effort to streamline the conversation today, I kindly ask the panelists to raise your hand. If you have, if you wanna interject, uh, we wanna make this dialogue uh, ongoing with, with the panelists as well as with the, the folks attending today. So the folks attending, if you have any questions, please enter your questions in the chat at the bottom. We will interject them into the conversation as we go along. And as for introductions, I think if anybody's attended any of my panels in the past, I don't like to introduce the panelists. I ask for the panelists to introduce themselves, give a little bit of background on how they ended up in the role that they're in today. And then maybe a little bit of background on today's topic and what it means to them, because it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. So with that, let's get started. I'll start with you, Matt. If you could, please provide your role, how you landed where you are today, and what's your experience with building software solutions in general? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, again, my name is Matt Mossberg. I've, uh, I'm now with Kroger. I've been with Kroger about uh, three months, so I'm very new uh, to the Kroger team. 
Uh, primarily, we're working in Azure and GCP. I've been working with uh, cloud solutions over five years. Uh, prior to uh, Kroger, I was with AAA Life Insurance Company uh, for two years. And prior to that, I was with General Motors uh, in their cloud uh, solutions activities. <clears throat> you know, uh, from uh, software uh, solutions, uh, you know, here at Kroger, the team's mainly focused on uh, what I'll call the foundational elements of the uh, of the cloud. Uh, so that is neo networking, security, all that type of things, where we enable uh, those uh, application development teams, you know, to, to create and develop things uh, as they needed. Uh, prior to that, I was the chief cloud architect at AAA Life, as I mentioned, uh, where I had responsibility for um, overall design and implementation of uh, a large data platform. A greenfield data platform. So we use quite a bit of uh, really cool uh, AWS technologies in that case uh, around uh, building uh, serverless pipelines and things. So um, that's kind of the quick intro of myself. I appreciate that. Uh, Trey, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. If you could just give a little background on your role, how you landed there and, and your experiences. Sure. Uh, so I'm a consultant with Pin Pinnacle Solutions Group. Uh, I've been in software development about 20 years. Last 10 of that consulting, uh, doing a mixture of dev and architecture. Um, I've been in cloud for, let's say, about three years. Um, you know, last two clients, you know, very heavy. Last client was, um, you know, really the, the client was new to the cloud. They had just lifted and shifted, you know, prior to me joining, like within a few months. Uh, so it was really about guiding them through, um, you know, through through that lift and shift, which are beyond lift and shift, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, you know, both, both clients in the fintech space. Um, so, yeah. Happy to share my experiences here. Appreciate that, Trey. And Mike Wells, we will we'll start uh, with you as well. If you could. Sure, I'm a second VP of development for Emeritas. Um, we're a life insurance company, financial services, you know, dental insurance, all the above. Um, so with that, I own Dev, DevOps, you know, our automated quality teams within those. Uh, prior to that, I was at Fidelity Investments for about 14 years, a little less than 14. Right, a wide variety of roles from developer to director of Dev there. Very good. Well, let's at, jump in. I'll say at Emeritas, you know, I really, I, I've led our journey to cloud enablement. And that is whether it's on-prem PaaS platforms or to AWS. Well, that, that, that kind of gives me a good segue here. So when, when evaluating, we'll stick with you, Mike, when evaluating the previous way uh, of software development and application development in, in the new way as we move into a more cloud-centric model, Give me a little bit of how do you go about that? What was different the old way versus the new way? Um, the, the old way is, you know, look, looking back, so I've been here seven years, and when you were building new applications, you would go request a, a VM or say, can I co-mingle my, my application on an existing app server or web server? And for instance, you may have challenges saying, hey, I've got a, a modern stack and I want to put it on here. But let's say it's running WebSphere and you're running a legacy version of WebSphere and you can't use the, the modern version of this Spring framework or this modern version of Java because there's dependencies of how that thing is tightly coupled. And then if you need to go do a, uh, an install, for instance, you may have to regression test everything that's installed inside of you know, that app server. It becomes a pain. It really slows things down. And some of those things, just planning could take you know, weeks or months. Um, that really led us to you know, the exploration of Docker really when it was in its infancy. So we've been at it for five, six years. Trey, I got to believe in your world. This is this is a timely conversation. Any input here? Uh, yeah, I agree with what some of Mike said. Um, the notion of the the olden days where you had to request VMs and wait, you know, probably days if not weeks to to get that kind of stuff stood up. Um, you know, in in the cloud, it's just so nice. I can go to a screen and spin up a, a VM spin up a service. Uh, and that's where I've been really impressed with sort of the, the, new, the new paradigm where, so my, my experience is at AWS and AWS has, I'm um, sure you can do, you know, like EC2 instances to do kind of traditional VM level management, but you can spin up like managed databases. You can spin up, you know, managed clusters for, you know, Redis or Elk Stack, any of that kind of stuff. And to have that just at the touch of your fingers, um, whereas previously you would have had to have kind of a team stand that up and maintain it, um, is just you know huge. Um, I think game changing. Matt, anything to add on your Fast side? Time to market. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, you know, as I think about it, you know, I, I'm a 
big proponent of uh, you know infrastructure as code. Uh, so as you start to think about uh, the cloud and the changes and differences from the old way to the new ways, you really start to think about uh, the cloud as a software defined data center. Um, you know, so you're literally need to have that developer mindset uh, to really employ and build out uh, a data center in the cloud, uh, you know, from all the way from, hey, building out the network stacks, all the security groups up to spinning up the appropriate uh, cloud uh, objects and artifacts, you know, whether it's a database, serverless compute or, or traditional, you know, IaaS compute on a VM. <clears throat> Talking more about that, moving moving apps from on-prem to the cloud. Can you can either of you, any uh, any of the three, give real life experience? Like, give me an example. Give me give me an application and walk me through the process of that evaluation. I don't think it was evaluation of the application. I think it was an evaluation of we wanted to move faster as an organization. Um, and it, so I don't think we really started with an app. I think we started with really the realization of if we need to increase time to market, looking at what's on our horizon, if we had to follow the old processes from a you know, SDLC, it wasn't gonna work, right? There were so many things coming down the horizon where we had to change our processes. And that's really where we started you know, building you know, containerized apps and we went all in. Yeah, we tried that. Um, yeah, so one of the examples after, um, you know, after the lift and shift, where it was kind of on VMs because it was great lift and shift from metal. Um, there was a new solution that came down the pike or new, new, um, new application. And, um, you know, we, we had recognized a lot of scalability issues with the current stack. And so we, uh, we went and looked at, you know, sort of the, the native solutions um, and the, uh, you know, Lambdas, Cognito, um, sort of that, that stack, sort of a reference implementation architecture um, was very, very powerful. And in particular, the solution, you know, being developed on behalf of one of their partners um, it wasn't really known how far it needed to scale. And that's where lambdas are really good at, at being able to scale from, you know, low to high without much thought and uh, made it a really good, really good option for that solution. Yeah, so uh, kind of following on with that, you know, one of the things that we're doing at Kroger, you know, like I said, we're using a fairly federated model. You know, we do not want to get into the way of, you uh, creativity and execution, uh, you know, with the work that we're doing. But we do have, you know, what we call our greenfield teams, uh, which provide consulting services out to the development teams uh, to enable them, train them, coach them into, hey, these are good design patterns uh, to be leveraged into the cloud. You know, so when we get people say, hey, we want to move into the cloud and we want to set up a whole bunch of VMs, we're like, hey, let's take a step back and evaluate, you know, do we want to refactor uh, this application? you know, into uh, some other way of microservices. Uh, and then, you know, what would be the PaaS platform that we want to put it on? You know, is it some sort of uh, .NET service fabric or, uh, you know, some sort of a Kubernetes clusters uh, running uh, our Docker containers? So, you know, we're, we're in the process of providing uh, that, that uh, guidance and uh, expertise, you know, all across the company uh, from, from the team that uh, we're leading now. Very good. I I want to pull the conversation a little up and out it, because our, the, the folks that are on this call aren't Kroger's. They yeah. aren't uh, all consulting organizations and not all are, are software developers and application developers. So taking the conversation from a higher level, it, I heard a lot of evaluation talk. I heard a lot of evaluating the application, how we were going to evaluating the stack into the, the new frontier. What is the best practice if I'm not a Kroger, if I don't have those in-house resources? Is it to go outside to leverage a third party that would do a cloud readiness assessment? Uh, what, what's the best practice that you would recommend? For, for me, I think there's, it depends on the size of your company, right? You can invest, you know, as little or as much as you want into this. And it doesn't matter for me, whether you choose Azure, whether you choose AWS, or whether you choose to do it on-prem. It's really how you redefine how you build applications in general. If you're not buying packages and you're building applications, you can containerize your applications. And how do you begin creating you know, light, lightweight applications uh, and containerizing them and taking away the construct of, you know, I need dedicated VMs, dedicated app servers, dedicated everything. And how do you start building really everything that sits inside of the container? You can do that on-prem. 
and how do you start that process? And you don't have to start all at once. And we started small. Uh, when we started, we, we enabled, you know, essentially spring boot with our applications. And we understood that would be a journey to get to containers next and sort of walking through that piece end to end. And we really started from an automation perspective, understanding whether it's on-prem or whether it's the cloud, how do I build the same pipelines and tech stacks to be able to build and deploy regardless where it was? And that ultimately led us to where we use Mirantis, who owns Docker now, where we've got essentially, you know, um, a Mirantis cluster management solution that deploys to AWS or on-prem. And we can move containers depending on if I want to be externally facing these cloud features to that instance, or I can run my PaaS platform on-prem with the same stacks, same resources, same tools, same everything. And that was a journey to get there. Trey, I, I got to think that you might have a different take on it. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's a, a good starting point. Um, you know, at the risk of sounding self-serving as a consultant, um, you know, it's certainly like, uh, you know, I think there's value in bringing in an expert to help you evaluate. Um, you know, it, I, uh, you know, I did, I, I actually engaged for, on behalf of a client, you know, evaluating uh, a CAS vendor and that CAS vendor supported all the clouds, they even did on-prem stuff. Um, you know, so for that client, they, they plugged them into AWS and, you know, stood up a Kubernetes service, you know, for them, um, you know, for that client. That was, you know, again, me getting to know the client well enough. Um, you know, that client had a really small team. They didn't really have an infrastructure team. So they were looking for solutions that would, you know, avoid having to scale up an infrastructure team to support, you know, whatever solution they would have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Matt, anything to add? Yeah, I'll add a little bit, you know, definitely uh, agree. If you're just starting out, you know, understand and be purposeful with, you know, what, what you're going to do. Um, you know, I'd, I'd recommend you bring in some uh, experts, you know, from the outside. Uh, so you learn quicker, right? You don't stub your toe as much, um, you know, learn from other people's uh, mistakes and, and those best practices. Also invest in your team. Um, you know, make sure they get the appropriate training, make sure they go to the, the right conferences, uh, really invest there. And, and again, you know, start small, right? Don't try to move an ERP application to the cloud as your first foray. Um, <laughs> that might be hard. Um, I'll tell you for a fact, it is hard. Uh, so, you know, start with something smaller yet meaningful, um, you know, a web form or, or something to that effect. So you definitely want to, you know, do that. Invest, as I mentioned before, invest in your team. And also start to make sure you're, um, you know, bringing together a cross-functional team, you know, perhaps even uh, right out of the gate, start to instantiate what does that cloud center of excellence look like, you know, usually led by uh, the cloud uh, enterprise architect. Um, so I'd encourage you guys, you know, the team members or folks that are embarking on that, you know, training cloud center of excellence, uh, start with a smaller yet meaningful application. Thank you for that. That's good insight. Let's let's flip it. What are the gotchas? What do what do we need to look out for as we go through this process? What what are the pitfalls that we need to avoid? Probably real life examples in your guys's world that you've had to overcome in the past. And we'll go back up to Mike to start that conversation. I think you've got there's there's a bunch, right? I mean, the resources are key. I think you, you've got to make sure you provide the adequate time and training. You're going to run into challenges. There's going to be things that you, you have to go solve that you didn't account for. While it's already in production, you're going to think through things, think through your ability to tear it back down and start back over if you forget something. Cost is key. Um, plan out your cost. Cost come from a variety of pieces. Do you need to run your software? Let's say you've got you know, non-production instances running. Do you need to run them 24-7? Do you shut them down? You're going to be charged for them every time they run. Um, <laughs> does that change the stack that you choose? Do you use Lambdas versus do I just run an EC2 instance all the time? Um, your deployment methodology is making sure that you can automate everything is key. Logging, 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 logging is key. Storage, networking, certificates, you know, all, all those different things are the challenges that you've got to go plan for that can just... You know, they can eat up hours and days and weeks. And I think the, the bigger one is just data exfiltration. If you need to move stuff back out of the cloud, back on-prem, plan for that. that. That can become, you know, overwhelming. Trey, any gotchas that you would, you would share? Yeah, building, building on the, um, you know, the, the export back to, like, if you're doing a hybrid solution, um, I don't have any hands-on experience with this because my clients have been fully in the cloud. But, um, you know, that exfiltration back to a data center, the, um, the bandwidth cost can be pricey. 
Uh, and that's something that's very easy to miss um, in, in some budget planning and cost planning. Um, for me, probably the, the biggest gotcha, because I, I did spend a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in Lambdas on uh, serverless architecture. Um, the two big takeaways that I had, um, more down in kind of the weeds level, but um, one is that the, um, the serverless framework, which is what we used, um, I've become a little disenchanted with that. And I've, I've been using Terraform more recently and I've become a big fan of that. Um, so again, that's something to evaluate and, and you know, find which is better for your team. Um, but the other, maybe at a higher level, is that the, um, the Lambda architecture, just the serverless architecture in general, um, sort of its, its promise is that it abstracts away all the infrastructure, like it abstracts away the architecture so that you're just providing your code and it runs your code. Um, I think the reality of that is while it does that, you still have to understand that architecture because when performance starts to become an issue, um, you really need to understand you know, what it's doing so that you know how to build your code to fit into that life cycle. Um, you know, cold boots are, are probably the classic example. In particular, in our case, we had Lambda's running inside of EPC, which actually exaggerates the cold boot problem. And those were things that we didn't realize until we got to production and started seeing performance issues. Um, so yeah, that's for me. Yeah, maybe a slightly uh, different thing to think about, you know, as a gotcha is uh, eventually, you know, once you kind of get out of that, uh, you know, dev test stage, uh, you got to run it in production and you need to really focus and build in security up front. Um, you know, make sure you're, you're ironing out what these network service uh, groups are, you know, to protect your environment, uh, protect all the IPs, you know. You know what? Uh, what Trey just mentioned. You know, understand uh, that architecture, right? So, if you're running things in a VPC, can you call them from different places? What's the latency? Um, how does that uh, data environment work? And I can't stress enough about uh, the data environment. Make sure you understand. You know what you're running for the data layer, databases, things like that. And if you're running a hybrid type of model, uh, and you're moving, you know, application X to the cloud. Um, understand what calls it makes to the applications that are still on your on-prem uh, solution uh, before you get there, right? Do those testings, understand you know, how latency sensitive uh, some of these applications are as you start to move things into the cloud. Um, those can be a real showstopper, uh, uh, kind of late in the game. So you need to understand and do that engineering up front. I think Matt, we'll if I, if I may layer on to one of the pieces that he just said on security, and it just depends on the stack that you're using. You know, if, you, if you're building containers, for instance, I would say the, the metrics into your, your containers, right? So you can get container sprawl and how do you, how do you understand what versions of Java are running in your uh, containers? How do you understand what operating system your containers are running on? All those have potential vulnerabilities in them that need managed and patched. And, thinking about those metrics and how you're going to pull those metrics out and how you have the life cycle of, you know, patching those, you know, that can run away from you pretty quick if you don't get in front of that. That should be part of your planning. Absolutely. I want to dovetail onto what Matt had mentioned I, and our friend Kevin Armour brought up a question. who's a former panelist uh, of ComSpark. Uh, what type of apps lend itself to serverless? Uh, loosely couple type apps. So maybe Matt, you could speak to that first because I think you mentioned a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, um, so, so what types of apps? Linda, a lot of lot of different use cases there. You know, um, really, you know, what I'll say is kind of these mid range type of applications. Um, you know, that are going to have somewhere. You know, not not you know thousands of transactions per hour, but maybe you know, more in the, in the line of hundreds of transactions uh, per hour uh, to run there because, you know, there are limits uh, to the serverless capabilities there. Um, you know, particularly, I'm a little bit familiar with Lambdas and things like that, probably not as much as Trey, but, um, you know, so you got to watch that and understand how that how that infrastructure works on the hood, as he mentioned earlier. Um, you can, you know, what I love about the, the serverless and Lambdas, uh, though, is you can, you, you don't have to constrain your developers to say, hey, you guys can only program in Java or uh, Kotlin or, you know, Python. You, you really, that really opens up uh, developers to program into, you know, uh, a programming that A, they like, and B, is going to help them, you know, deliver that business value faster. Um, you know, things that probably aren't great fits are super high transactional things, uh, you know, into serverless capabilities. Um, the other things that I love about serverless capabilities 
will to also include things that only run once in a while, right? Why run a whole VM 24 hours a day uh, to run that capability? Sure, you can, you know, spin up spot instances and things like that uh, to run that capability, but then you've got more infrastructure management, you know, start, retry, stop uh, type of things that you got to focus on with, you know, spot instances on VMs. Uh, so things like Lambda help take away some of that overhead and knowledge. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. Try anything to add there? Yeah, I agree with everything that Matt just said. Um, you know, apps that are that are more infrequently used or maybe more business cycle. Um, you know, like the, the mainland app that we built was used about half the day because it was just, you know, kind of a, a coast to coast business day. Um, so we were only paying for, you know, the half that we were using. Um, the I'm, I'm especially a big fan of using lambdas for like non API. It's certainly it's good for API and I don't want to make it sound like I'm not endorsing it for that. But for things like event driven architectures where you're, you're dealing with topics and queues and things like that, uh, those event driven architectures, I think, thrive in the lambda space um, because the lambdas are just such a natural fit. Uh, the notion of lambdas being able to trigger on API calls just as easily as queues topics or other things. Um, I think are just a very natural fit for uh, for that architecture. Mike, anything to follow up on? Not on that one. Okay, very good. He did have a follow up. Uh, so, app or a microservice? What would you recommend, and and why? I don't know um, if there's anything to add there. Microservices, in my mind, mean different things to different people, um, and understand from the purest of microservice, why do you need it, right? Not everything belongs to that. There's a, there's a decent amount of overhead that can come with that around. You know, if I've got a, you know, let's say something that's doing a file poll, looking for something moving into a processor type of a piece. If something happens to one, you know, how do you have a circuit breaker to make sure things, you know, can actually stop the process? Uh, there's just a lot to think through before you go down the purest of a microservice. And you can add a ton of overhead and a ton of complexity unnecessarily. So I would say, understand why you're trying to go do that. Yeah, I think that that, that comes down to the question of wh where do the workloads need to reside and how, how do you go about that evaluation process? I'll open uh, that I up think, to the you point. know, it's just app architecture, right? You have to understand what, what's your inputs, what's your outputs, and, you know, understand just what's the capacity of that thing and, you know, there's a reason Netflix and people, you know, have microservice-based architectures based on volume, how, how they have to split things out and process data. Not everybody needs to take it that far. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I think it comes down to, you know, the, the notion, I mean, I think one of the, the big claims of, of microservices, while it means different things to different people, one of the goals is to be able to um, scale independently of other parts of the application. So kind of at the, at the one end, you've got Monolith, where if you want to scale up a particular segment of that app, well, you're having to duplicate that entire app over and over again, even though you really only need that one particular vertical to scale. Um, I think at the opposite end of that spectrum are, you know, lambdas, because at that point, like somewhere in the middle, you might have more of containers and kind of normal apps where you can still split them out separately. Um, but you are, you're still like a cohesive unit, kind of in a multi-threaded type of capacity. Whereas when you go all the way to the other end with serverless, you have each instance of that Lambda is its own application. It's completely isolated rather than, so instead of dealing with multi-threaded, you are completely isolated and there's no overlap between them. Um, you know, think of it like a container instance running a single request, which it actually is that architecture under the covers, but um, you know, that's, and that's, it, it all depends on how independently you need to, 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 to scale things because when you get to that level, well, you can totally scale, you know, the throughput or the, the scalability of a particular endpoint, not just, you know, a, a domain, for example, like a like a container would. Yeah, when I when I start to think about you know app versus uh, API um, or microservice, you know, I, I start to think about it. Hey, is this need to get um, called, you know, from another external application or set of users? Right. In that case, definitely, I'm, you know, all about getting that set up as an API you know, via microservice. Uh, things like you know, you get into. Hey, I need to do some transformation of uh, of data uh, from uh, point A to point B. Hey, yes, serverless architecture, um, you know, works real well uh, in that particular case. But it's a, it's more of an app and not an API, 
right? So if, if you need the overhead of an API because you've got to, you know, enable it and present it externally, for sure, yeah, definitely want to do that. Um, if it doesn't need to, then, you know, perhaps uh, just small, uh, smaller segments of code running in, you know, containers or serverless uh, infrastructure would be a, a slightly better approach. So I want to go back to something that Matt brought up uh, a couple segments or a couple questions ago. Two items. One is security, and then two is managing expense. So let's start with the expense conversation. How do we understand the expense going in, and then how do we manage the expense from an operational standpoint? And I'll I'll start with you, Mike. And is that from just cloud in general, or is that the microservice conversation? I guess or only both. Both, yeah, because I think that the the conversation. Mm -hmm. We keep going very narrow, and I think I, I want to stay a little bit higher for the the, the grander conversation. You, you know, when I look at when I look at anything, whether whether you're building cloud or microservices or packaged applications, you when you evaluate something, it's what's the cost to what I call plan build run, right? Plan is my ability to architect and design it. What's my cost around that? The build piece is, you know, what do I need from an engineering perspective to go build that? That could be software expenses. That could be hardware expenses. And then the run piece, you know, what do I need to go run that from a cost perspective? So I try to look at it in all three of those dimensions um, and, and cost, I would say cost contain each one of those and how am I gonna make decisions around those? And not everything needs to be, you know, gold plated or silver plated or bronze plated. And you know, you've got to make those decisions mm -hmm. as you, you, you pick to go down whatever journey you're gonna go. Trey? Uh, yeah, I think all that was good advice. Um, I think in, in um, you know, my experience in trying to manage the costs, um, you know, AWS has some great tools for, you know, letting you know when expenses are approaching certain thresholds, um, you know, things like that. The, uh, the thing I always like to, to uh, comment on, at least in the AWS space, is that they have, you know, reserved instances, which are almost like prepaid plans, not, not fully prepaid up front, but the idea is when you, when you have an understanding of how much capacity you're going to use over the next year, um, you can commit to, to using that amount of resource and save money, uh, usually in the ballpark of 30%. So that's something always good to keep in mind when you're, when you're running the calculator, things like that, um, to, to know that that's an option. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Okay. Matt, anything else to add on the, the expense management standpoint? Yeah, yeah. So when I think about ex expense, you know, Mike said, you know, we've got to, you got to make sure you've got a good architecture up front, right? How are you going to run this? Uh, and particularly be focused on, you know, speeds and feeds types of data, right? How many calls, how much data is going to move in and out of uh, the cloud, right? All those things uh, tend to add up. The other thing that, you know, really you start doing trade-offs and, you know, as part of the software, you know, is this a VM type of uh, deployment or is this a serverless type of deployment? They can have profound effects on, on, on the cost. The other thing to think about, and I'll say, you know, start focusing on it, what's the return on investment, right? Uh, we brought it up a little bit before. If you want to, you know, deploy a Microsoft SQL Server on a VM, right? You're still responsible for all that patching, all that maintenance, all that security, and engineering, right? How do you do the backups, everything? As you start to think about, hey, maybe uh, leveraging a managed uh, SQL instance in, say, Azure, um, you know, you you take a lot of that engineering, a lot of that operational overhead off the table. Um, so where you can, uh, you may want to consider starting to leverage. Uh, PaaS instances, because instead of doing all that engineering for yourself in your data center, um, you can offload it to the cloud provider and they, they've already done it for you. And, and it works out uh, pretty well uh, in a vast majority of cases. So, you know, I'd encourage you as, as a total cost of ownership, really start to think about, hey, you know, what does this take in the way of, you know, engineering effort? Because um, people can be a little bit expensive on the, uh, on the engineering side, right? You can't underestimate, you know, <laughs> hey, it's going to take you know, three weeks to engineer this new SQL release, plus every month I have to patch it, right? And that's going to be, you know, another two or three days, right? Ongoing perpetuity of, of maintenance uh, costs. So, you know, investigate and, uh, and you know, deliberate on your leveraging of these, you know, platform as a service capabilities from the cloud providers. 
Yeah. And maybe it's just me. I just, I don't like surprise bills. I want to, I want to know the like expectations going in and what that ongoing operational expense is going to be. I don't, I don't want to surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I so let's go on something Matt said though. Go ahead, Trey. Uh, with regards to trade-offs, <laughs> ROI. Uh, so different companies, you know, go into or look to the cloud for different things. And I think one of the important trade-offs to, to consider is, you know, maybe acknowledging that you're going to spend a little more money, but to transform the business and, and get that ROI in the form of time to market. You know, being able to develop faster. Yeah. Uh, that's something Matt touched on with, you know, like doing a, a managed SQL server, you know, save three weeks of design time and just use that managed solution and, you know, point, point and click upgrades rather than, you know, weeks long planning to do an upgrade, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I want to chime in on that a little bit. I think we, we've, we have a, a hybrid model of, I would say our data center deployment where we have AWS and we have on-prem, but we build almost say cloud native applications on-prem on our Docker clusters, on-prem. And if we can choose to use and extend certain features within that, to AWS, we push it there too. So I think there's just a piece there where you can get the both of both worlds and potentially contain your cost by, you know, having a hybrid uh, solution using the same build processes. So we, we're, we're pushing probably a thousand containers on-prem. <laughs> That's not even our cloud piece. So take it from a security perspective now, <laughs> Not only as we evaluate the, during the shift and, and shifting to the cloud, but post shift, so beyond the lift and shift, how do we continue to evaluate the security framework around those applications? And I'll start with you, Mike, if you could. Um, I don't. I think you evaluate your your security. I think the same whether it's on Amazon Azure or on prem. I think you know we we look whether it's externally facing, whether it's internally facing. Um, and we look at it from, you know, it, it, do, I, do I design it where I need to pen test this application, pen test the API? Do I look at the network security pieces of that, the server security pieces, the operating system? Do I look at inside the containers? Um, for, for us, it's all about incorporating pipelines for security, right? So <clears throat> we pull things as far left as we can into our pipelines, our build practices, and have security constantly running against them. And that's whether it's pen test running, that's whether our build practices have, you know, you know, static analysis, stats analysis, whatever else is in there, you know, call us running against things. It's, we pull it as far left as we can and report, report and build that into our processes for remediation. But I, I could, we could spend hours and hours on that. I'm not sure where you want to go on that. <laughs> That was, that was a perfect high level answer there. High, 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 le- high level, you have to look at everything, right? And yeah. you know, I think you contain it externally, you put a little more, more rigor around it. Internally, you put, you know, a, maybe, maybe a little less, right? Where you don't do things, right? Am I going to pen test my internal based applications? Probably not. Um, am I going to have firewall based rules for my internal based applications? Maybe not. External, for sure. Um, do I, do I have the same pipelines for internal apps versus external apps regarding, you know, static analysis, things like that? Sure. It's everything's the same. That, that, that answer right there is why I love the circuit and I love the breakfast pipe because you just lifted up the curtain a little bit. You could see in a little bit. The cards are a little further away from the vest. I appreciate <laughs> that, Mike. Uh, Trey, Matt, anything to add to that? I yeah, I'll say the, Mike um, covered it a lot. You know, uh, security is probably its own deep dive, multi-week <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Um, but the one thing I'll just add in is um, work with your security team right out of the gate, right? Don't wait. Build in security up front. Um, engage those folks. Get their requirements. Train them, right? You know, you, know, you do things a little bit differently in the cloud than they're used to uh, in the uh, data center. So, you know, make sure they're, you know, getting the appropriate training and they're getting to, you know, these conferences and things like that so they can learn and stay, you know, up to speed on all the new and emerging threats uh, that security and hackers bring, so. Trey, anything to add? I think Matt and Mike covered it, I think. Um, the identity access management is probably the... <coughs> thing you know when you do the lift and shift you're probably dealing with more you know server level kind of traditional security patterns but as you build into those you know serverless or managed solutions um you know identity access management is going to be your your bread and butter um so important to get that right focus on you know granular permissions resource specific if possible um those sorts of things yeah and tracy brought up and it kind of goes along with with Trey's answer there, what if you don't have a security team? It's someone someone's extra responsibility then. 
or it's is everybody's that... responsibility. That's what I was going to add to that. Responsibility. Whether it's your testers, your business, you know, your developers, you as a manager, it's everybody's responsibility. Agreed. And it, it's never ending, right? It's always evolving. So uh, let's take the conversation from a governance and QA process. Uh, how, how does that change within the cloud platforms versus on-prem? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Mike, if you could respond to that. Governance is definitely a little different. I think <clears throat> if, if you think about traditional on-prem versus you know, off-prem, I think there's just, um, or cloud in general, responsibilities change, right? I think just look at a container in general, right? <clears throat> A container has an operating system. It could have a database inside of it. It could have, you know, an app server or web server. In a lot of organizations, different teams used to manage those pieces. And it was governance structure around, here's the app server you're going to use, here's the web server you're going to use, here's the database that you're going to use. There was different pieces. Now, when you shift that thing as far left as possible, most of that lives within the developer's responsibility. And they have the ability to, to really package anything they want at speed. Um, so the governance process really changes. You know, we, we have a, you know, a, a trusted registry of here's our images that developers can pull from. Somebody certifies those images. We allow what we want to be put into there where people just can't go, you know, randomly pull down and pull whatever they want. So we've, we've worked to evolve that process over years. Um, but you have to put governance around, you know, what do you want allowed in your environment? Because with containers, you can pretty much put whatever you want in there at will. And you, you want to have a little bit of control around that. So I think that's that's the governance piece I would encourage people to look at is once you go down that journey, whether it's on-prem or off-prem from a container perspective, you know, sky's the limit on how far and how fast you can push. Trey, anything to add there? Yeah, so on the on the governance side, um, AWS has some really nice tooling for, you know, monitoring and even honestly applying certain, certain governance policies to resources within the system. Now, of course, that's going to be limited to, you know, the, the sort of the native services. Um, you know, they, they can't be looking into your EC2 instances, for example, as you might expect. But you can go in and say, like, I want to make sure that all topics are encrypted. I want to make sure all databases are encrypted. Um, things like that. And it can spit out a report. And then you even have an option to push a button and say, I want to make them all encrypted. And it'll just force it. Um, so you can, get, you can get as, you know, as lax or as strict as you want to get um, at will. Yeah. The QA well, side, um, I would say that I, from, uh, from my, you know, ex observations and experiences that I don't think QA was forced to change their processes, but I felt that they felt empowered. Like they were, they, they gained new options. Um, you know, the, you know, the classic being able to spin up and tear down test environments to run, you know, unit test suites and things like that. Um, very, very powerful. And, and that's something that, you know, was, was a little lacking, you know, pre-cloud. Mac, you know, go one ahead. of the things that you, you start to think about governance is, you know, governance needs to be a collaborative uh, environment because everybody's got a slightly different need. Um, so I've always encouraged let's let's have these conversations, you know, in a, in a centralized forum, you know, such as a, a cloud center of excellence or a cloud governance type of forum to make sure, you know, you're understanding, hey, what does the operations team need? What does the infrastructure teams need? What is the development teams and security teams. And, and of course, you know, and we touched on it a little bit, but, you know, what is the, what does the financial team need, right? You know, to do, uh, you know, cost containment and, you know, cloud fin uh, financial operations as well, right? So you, you, you really need to bring all those different uh, roles together, um, you know, in some sort of, uh, you know, centralized group. You know, a lot of people call it the cloud center of excellence, but, uh, you know, you definitely need to, Need to pull those uh, pull those uh, different roles together so everybody knows what everybody else is doing, and you know you can have some good uh, you know collaboration, understanding of the needs for for all the team members to provide that governance layer. Great input, David brings a good a good question up in the in the chat. Here is how, how do you evaluate from an end user accessing said application, said cloud environment? Do you guys entertain that thought of how the end users are going to interact with the app as it relates to network and security around the network? That's something that you consider, and I'll open that up to the floor here. So I, I think my, my response there is to find an end user, right? Um, I, I think we could say an end user is a developer, right? Or we could say it's a customer that's accessing our app. So 
if, if the answer is different on depending on what it is, I think we do we do really put governance and controls even around who's allowed to do what in our AWS instance. Um, so there, there is restrictions around that. You don't want that to be a free for all. And again, you've got to think from a, a cost containment perspective there if, if or an access perspective, who do you want to do that? What's the responsibility you want your developers to have? In a lot of cases, you know, our developers don't have direct access to AWS. Um, most of our stuff is pushed there through our pipelines. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we control that from an end user perspective. I mean, we can take that a hundred different directions. I'm not sure what, what anybody else's thoughts are on that or if they want to elaborate a little more. Yeah, um, this is Matt. Uh, I'll say, you know, ideally, uh, when I think about uh, the way this question was posed, is there should be no difference, right? Um, you know, the application should be available. The end user should, you know, not be aware of where it's running or how it's running. Uh, they're just able to use it, uh, you know, in a, a cost-effective and you know manner. Uh, you know, developers and, you know, people building out new applications, yeah, there's going to be some differences depending on, you know, do you have a different, uh, you know, PaaS platform on-prem versus in the cloud? Yeah there, yeah, there could be some differences there, and that's going to be, uh, you know, something that'll have to be get looked at. But again, you know, you want to make it, uh, security should be unobtrusive as possible so the, you know, developer can deliver business value as quickly as possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, I don't think of it differently from a security perspective. You need some extra advantages, just the nature that the cloud is a little more distributed. Um, you know, like for example, standing up an API gateway, you get an extra option that says, hey, I want to make that, you know, regional, um, you know, being make it, make it uh, more of like a CDN, you know, so geographically optimized rather than just kind of living in, in the one data center where it's at. You kind of get that for free. Mm -hmm. But that's not really a security consideration. Yeah, very good. Great feedback, guys. Um, that's all the questions I had. Uh, I want to thank Matt Mossberg, Trey Howard, Mike Wells uh, for being our panelists today. Uh, I'll hand it back to Tracy. I think you were going to facilitate the Q&A. Uh, so I appreciate everybody being a part of today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great discussion. I think we had some good questions that came through the chat that were addressed throughout the session. I'm not seeing any additional questions that came here. Um, that, that we weren't already. Um, other, uh, thank you, Bill. What about cloud diversification? That's one I've always had. How do you know which cloud, the big boys versus local, smaller, regional, private, the big boys against each other? Um, I, I could take a shot at that one. I think, again, it depends. What are you trying, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, I think the other piece is understanding where you're at and where you're allowed to recruit uh, geographically is key. You know. If all of a sudden you're trying to find some smaller base cloud, do the resources exist in your market to recruit for that if you can't hire remote workers? Um, so I think understanding your, your, your talent pool and your geography is key. Understanding, you know, um, what services that are unique to one of those um, that you would want to use. I think in a lot of cases, you, you want to figure out how do you not become bound to one cloud provider and your ability to move, right? So do you design your applications where you're portable and you're not bound to one? In a lot of cases, there are things that are unique to to each to each cloud provider. But you know, the core of your applications, if you can make those a little portable, might make you a, a little more effective long term. Trey, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, again, I think it depends on what you're trying to build for. If you're looking to build for, you know, redundancy of of cloud providers, you know, spanning, you know, Google and and AWS, for example, um, that's something that certainly can be done. I know that there are some you know, Active Directory solutions that will bridge that from like an authentication security perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I've not been a part of that before, um, but I definitely agree with the, the notion of even if you stick with one provider, uh, which I think is pretty common, keeping yourself portable, be, you know, make make deliberate decisions about if you're going to em embrace a particular technology or service, um, you know, what does that do to you from a vendor lock-in perspective? Matt, anything to add? Sure, sure. You know, um, so if you're a smaller organization, you know, having uh, multiple clouds is probably not a great idea, um, you know, because of the differences between the clouds uh, and the ability, you know, to kind of build those foundational elements, network, security, monitoring, 
right? They're all a little different in the clouds, right? And if you start thinking about, hey, I got to monitor an AWS this way, and I got to monitor, say, GCP a totally different way, you know, how do you do that in a, in a somewhat consistent manner? So, you know, you, you can do that. Uh, portability of code, uh, that's great. I'll, I'll really even play a little bit of devil's advocate. Um, uh, when we uh, looked at, uh, when I was at AAA Life, when we looked at it, and we said, hey, we're going to embrace AWS for all of our um, data solutions, uh, you know, for our uh, Greenfield, um, you know, data and analytics capability. We totally embraced all of the AWS uh, services uh, to really allow us to move quicker, um, you know, and have less overhead by writing something that is, you know, cloud agnostic. So in some cases, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate and say, hey, really embrace, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, the, the cloud providers, you know, platform as a service, uh, it's going to allow you to uh, deliver capabilities faster. Um, of course, that comes with the golden handcuffs, right? I'm going to be locked into that cloud provider until uh, such time that we're, you know, able to rewrite it to uh, some, some other capability. Um, you know, so, so you got, you really got to think about that up front um, and decide, you know, is this something that I'm going to make a strategic direction you know, for the next, you know, three to five years to leverage AWS for uh, data platform, you know, that, that could make sense. Uh, if you think you're going to pivot, then you might have to write something a little bit more agnostically so you can move it around. All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to ask a question of our panel and of everyone who's participating. And if you've um, joined us and listened in today, please share your response to this question in the chat. Um, I'm going to give the panel a second to think about it, and I'll go on and do some public service announcements in the middle and uh, come back to get their answers. But the question is, based on what you've seen and done in this, what's the one or two biggest lessons you would pass on to someone um, tackling this, you know, working in the cloud and, and making that decision, how do you go? So what's kind of your, your one leave behind thought for everybody here? So while I let the, our panelists ponder that momentarily, uh, just a couple reminders. Um, our IT Leadership Institute launched uh, just a couple weeks ago. There are still two spots open in the cohort. And since our um, illustrious leader for that program, Hydrink, has decided to conduct a makeup session. So if any of you are interested in submitting someone to that Leadership Institute, please reach out to me, Tracy at the circuit.net, and we'll fill in all the answers and the questions. The information is also on our website. Uh, it is a 10-month leadership training program designed specifically for IT people, um, and it's being led by someone with an IT background who does that now. So we're really excited about this. Our first session went well, and the uh, participants really uh, engaged in the material and shared a lot, and uh, so I'm excited about that program. Also, since we've been talking software, um, hopefully many of you are aware that we just completed our annual Momentum Developers Conference. Um, I'll throw it out there. We're already starting to plan for next year. If any of you would be interested in joining us to select our topics for that day um, so that we have great content, uh, we'd love to have some new folks and some additional diversity on that selection committee. Uh, so just reach out to me for that. To give you some idea, we had 300 folks in attendance um, we had 170 submissions for our 30 speaker spots. So having people like you really um, scan that and know you don't have to scan all 130, you pick a category, so you only have a few. So don't worry, you're not spending hours reading speaker submissions. Uh, but we're pretty, pretty proud of the folks and, and the effort that's been made there. So that's enough of the commercials. So now I'll start with Trey. What are your, your final parting thoughts? And thanks, Kevin, for putting yours in the chat. Yeah, I really like Kevin's answer. Um, it, it, kind of in the in the same vein, um, you know, make sure you know what your goals are in, in adopting cloud. Um, you know, cost cost you need to be. You don't need to have cost savings as a as a goal. I think that speaks to Kevin's answer. Okay. Right. Yeah, Kevin's. It's not cheaper, but it is much better. So thanks, Kevin. Matt. Um, I'll say, you know, making sure you've got, you know, a cross-functional team uh, to really understand and, and rally around what you're trying to achieve in the cloud, right? Uh, it kind of go, a little bit of a broken record here, but, you know, developing and, and reinforcing a cloud center of excellence is, is really critical to make sure you, you've got everybody on the same page and everybody understands, uh, you know, what you're trying to achieve and, and understand the ROI you're trying to drive out. Thanks, Matt. And Mike? Stecco, what Matt said, I think 
Um, just making sure you have buy-in from everyone. You'll need support from more than just development or cloud architecture, whomever you have. You're gonna need people from a storage perspective, a networking perspective, a security perspective, your executive buy-ins. Um, you are changing your processes. So I think having that cross-functional team for buy-in around what that vision is gonna be is it's the most important thing. Great, thanks. So once again, thank you so much to all of you on the panel, Trey, Matt, and Mike. Uh, thanks to Nick for moderating and to uh, ATC overall as our great partner for this program. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you back on our December session, which will be over lunchtime. Um, so keep your eye out for the information on that and more to come. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thank you.